The average human has 70,000 thoughts a day. Not huge elaborate ones, but just stray little fragmentary thoughts. 70,000 of them pass through consciousness every day. And the problem is that we don't know how to process them or use them. It's part of the reason why we end up with such you know, busy and troubling minds. We haven't stepped back in order to ask ourselves at the end of the day, some of those questions that can calm us down, like, who am I angry with? What am I excited by? What's really happened today? We let experiences rush past us. And then, of course, experiences that haven't been digested properly have a nasty habit of coming to sting us in the tail. And I think you can look at a lot of mental troubles as essentially the outgrowth of unprocessed emotion. Depression is often sadness that hasn't understood itself. Anxiety or irritability is worry that doesn't know its own cause. And so often what we need, particularly in the modern world, is occasions on which we can get to know our own minds. It's a strange thing. Surely we know our own minds. Surely we know. No, no. The way that we're built is obviously not prioritizing a full awareness of ourselves. We're outward facing creatures, we're action focused creatures, which is all to the good and has many advantages. But because of the way we live now, more sedentary lives, lives that call upon us, not merely to be active, but also to be fulfilled, those lives require periods of introspection that our routines often don't allow for. So take that time in the evening and just sit down in a semi-darkened room and just ask yourself, what's coming up for me? What's really happened inside me? Because it can take a little while to realize what you're really upset by, what you're really excited by, etc. We're not obvious to ourselves. And as I say, so many of things that we call mental disorders or mental illnesses are really stored emotion that hasn't found a way out. Emotions that haven't been acknowledged have a nasty habit of stirring our conscience, demanding to be heard. They might want to tell our spines, they might want to tell our stomachs. So as not to be struck by so many of these psychosomatic disorders is to ask the body what it's trying to tell you so that it doesn't need to tell you in the more dramatic forms that end up as illnesses. If you lie down, you simply say to yourself, if my back could speak, what does it want to tell me? If my shoulders could have their say, what are they trying to say? If my stomach could have a voice, what might it be trying to utter? Insomnia is, if you like, a kind of revenge for all those thoughts that you were so careful not to have in the day. You very carefully schemed not to have those thoughts in the day. Because of our emotional conscience, they want to be heard. And if you're not hearing them at 3 p.m., you're going to be hearing them at 3 a.m. And so, you know, one of the best ways to sleep is to make sure you're having a little bit more of an in-depth conversation with yourself before you enter sleep, because that will allow you that kind of deeper rest. We have this emotional conscience that requires that the key things about us have a chance to be heard. And I mean, this is the whole theory of trauma. Events in our past, especially in our early childhood, that we have not had a chance to properly understand. And how much can a three, four, five, six year old understand? Events that we can't understand, it doesn't mean that they haven't registered. They've registered all the more deeply and they haven't had a chance to be processed. A friend of mine recently lost a parent. He's in his 50s, well-educated, got resources, got friends, spouse, etc. He was telling me he was laid low by depression, just couldn't get out of bed, completely stunned by his loss. And I was thinking, in a way, he's lucky because he's got all those resources of adulthood. Imagine a five-year-old child who suffers a bereavement. They've got no friends that they can have those sort of dialogues with. They've got no books that they can re read about this. They've got no capacity to process. They've got no understanding of time, etc. Emotions that can't be had lodge themselves in us and gum up our systems. And I think so much of the work that we need to do on ourselves is to process pain that has not been properly understood, not because anyone's evil, but because we've lacked the resources to do so.
Modern times have obviously brought us enormous advantages, but they've also brought us particular complexities that I think we'd be wise to, to realize. And one of them is the disappearance of religion. I mean, we are still among the first generations in many parts of the world to be trying to live good lives without the support of religion. Think of how religions structure time and human experience in time. As a religious person, you immediately feel the present moment is not as important as a hundred, two hundred, two thousand million year history that has come before and that will continue after. The present moment is a speck in time and, and there's a whole narrative of which you're part of that immediately diminishes you in scale. Now, nowadays, all of us want to be rather large, don't we? we want to be big, big people. We want to make a big impression. But arguably, this is a fast route to mental illness because the graceful acceptance of your minuscule position in the cosmos is the gateway to calm and harmony. And when people say, you know, I went into this hotel, you know, the person made me feel small. That's a bad way of being made to feel small, but there's a good way of being made to feel small. Pick up an ancient text, read words that were written by someone in a f foreign tongue 3,000 years ago. That'll make you feel small. Go into the desert. Notice the, the age of the rocks inscribed in, you know, time inscribed in sand. That'll put you in your place. Spend time with an animal that has no concern for your status, your sense of importance, your foiled narrative of your own success. All these things that drive modern humans mad, these are not present in an older kind of religious sphere. And uh, as I say, what religions do is they tell us you're part of a bigger story. They also tell us, many faiths tell us, that life and you in particular are imperfect. Think of Catholicism and its notion of original sin. Lots of bad stuff associated with original sin. I'm not you know, a huge fan of many aspects, but let's look at the good side, right? What, it, what Catholicism tells us is that everybody's broken. Everybody is flawed. It's quite a helpful starting point, right? Because if you think, well, all right, I'm a bit broken, but so is somebody else, so is somebody else. So we're all doing our best. That's the gateway to vulnerability, to friendship, if you like, lower expectations, but also to, to connection with others. So often people who become successful find it really hard to make friends. Why? Because they associate success with invulnerability. And the more successful they get, the harder it is for them to admit to the real truth about being human, which is that we're all helpless children, some of the time, at least, frightened, helpless children. And it becomes harder to make to keep up the contact with that, let alone admit that to somebody else. So again, religions handily reduce our expectations and our sense of ourselves. We are merely flawed humans. There is a perfect world. It doesn't exist in Beverly Hills. It doesn't exist in you know the, the fancy parts of Singapore or, or Sydney. It exists up there in, a, in another world. In other words, the human realm is inherently imperfect. Quite a good starting point. I mean, even if you went on a date, right? Imagine two characters you might go on a date with, right? First one tells you, yeah, I'm kind of perfect and I'm, achieve, I'm aiming to achieve total perfection. You think, wow, good for them, but slightly scary. Next to somebody else who goes, I'm kind of flawed, but I'm sort of managing my flaws and I'm interested in how to get to know my flaws and work with them. Instantly one thinks, hmm, life might be easier around such a person. There's, there's something about the pursuit of perfection which makes day-to-day -day life extremely hard. And religions, slightly by the by, tick that box. They were able to reduce us in our own eyes while raising us in the eyes of you know, a divine being. And that helped us to have an easier relationship with, with ourselves. And, and the notion also was, you cannot perfect this life. Life becomes perfect in another realm. We'll build Jerusalem somewhere else, not on this earth, in the next world. Again, it takes the pressure off us. We moderns, we modern people, we think the present moment is supremely important. Now is important. Everything that's going on right now is supremely important. Doesn't matter what happened 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Now is the only criteria of time. You are perfectible, right? So if there's something wrong with you, you're failing against an ideal of perfection. Again, very, very hard. And that you are made, the biggest challenge of all, you're made to be happy as you suggested, that the true goal of every human is happiness. Not fulfillment, not uh, you know the realization of a grand scheme, not living for others, your own happiness. And again, it's a beautiful idea, but goodness me does it cause problems. Think of Emil Durkheim, beginning of the 20th century, 
French sociologist, writes this book contrasting the differences between ancient societies and modern societies. And he identifies one troubling difference between ancient societies, pre-modern agricultural village-based societies where religion plays a role, and modern urban technologically driven success-oriented individualistic societies, and that's the suicide rate. He realizes in his book On Suicide, published in 1900, that modern societies, for all their advantages, leads their members, a share of their members, often the most ambitious of their members, to take their own lives. Why? What's going on? Well, it's the birth of modern sociology, really. It becomes a major inquiry into what modern times does to the soul. And I'm deeply fascinated by that. I can't let that one go. Because what's this paradox? What's this paradox of suffering amidst plenty, of regress amidst progress? This fascinates me. People don't just commit suicide when things are bad. People commit suicide when things are bad and they think, it's a delicate point, they think it's their fault. They cannot disassociate the trouble they feel from an intense sense of responsibility, which then also entails shame. Now, what's going on there? When I say that we live in an individualistic world, what that really means is we live in a world where people feel that they control their own narratives, that what happens to them is very tightly a reflection of who they are and what they've done. And this was not always the case. For long periods of history, people were not necessarily tightly held to the observable outcomes of their lives. This happened with money, for example. In Old English, a poor person was known as an unfortunate. Let's unpack that word, unfortunate. There's the word fortuna in there. What was fortuna? For the Romans, fortuna was the goddess of luck, the goddess of fortune. And the Romans were therefore all the time sacrificing things to the goddess of fortune as a way of saying, you know, please, it's not me it's this outside agency. Nowadays, this sounds completely weird. I mean, what do we call, in the most individualistic country in the world, United States, what are poor people called? It's not a nice term, they're called losers, right? You say, that's a loser. So we've gone from unfortunate to loser. That's a trajectory of 400 years. What's happened in that time is a story about who's responsible for people's fate. We don't allow people the benefit of luck. We believe that people do things and that that action leads to results or failures. And that's why people take their own lives. Because in extremists, people think there is nothing other than me to explain what happens to me. Of course, the reality is much more complicated. I'm not saying that's the truth, but that is the perceived truth. We live in a world that is meritocratic, right? That word, meritocracy, is on everybody's lips. If you take politicians, left and right, in the United States, all over the world, everybody wants to create a world that is meritocratic. Meritocratic is, the concept of meritocracy is a, a world in which um, people's outcomes are dependent on their merit, rather than on who their parents were, um, some corrupt class in society, the influence of whatever. So, you know, a left-wing politician and a right-wing politician say, we want to make a meritocratic world where your kids will go to where they deserve, where if you work hard, you can get there. And, um, you know, where everyone has a chance to succeed. It's the rhetoric of modern times. Now, it's great. And in many ways, it's an enormous advance. But again, let's just focus on the psychological toll of that. Because if you really believe in a world in which those who get to the top deserve to get to the top, by implication, you are also positing the existence of a world in which those who are at the bottom deserve to be at the bottom. In other words, a meritocratic worldview turns success and failure from chance to a necessary fate. And that's why it makes the winners quite hard potentially quite heartless because they're thinking, well, I got there on my own, you, you know, mm. don't need to thank anybody. And similarly, those at the bottom are kind of crushed.